guys, today's video is about antiarrhythmic medications. And since atrial fibrillation or AFib is one of the most common um, arrhythmias that you guys will be seeing and treating in the office, I figured that we would really focus on AFib today. So today's lecture is going to be an in-depth discussion of the pharma <clears throat> pharmacologic strategies that you will employ in the management of atrial fibrillation. When developing the pharmacotherapeutic plan for a patient with atrial fibrillation, there are two major questions that need to be answered or two major decisions that need to be made. One, we need to evaluate the need for systemic anticoagulation. So does the patient need to be anticoagulated? And then the second question is whether you're going to pursue a rate control strategy or a rhythm control strategy. Are you going to try and convert the patient back to normal sinus rhythm or are you just going to try and slow the ventricular rate to improve cardiac output? So um, first, let's just kind of introduce the um, prevention of systemic embolism. Patients with atrial fibrillation are at a higher risk for the formation of a um, atrial or atrial appendage thrombus. So clots form up in the atrium. And then obviously those clots can dislodge, travel throughout the body. And then the patient is at a higher risk for um, some things like stroke, for example. So we look at each patient with AFib and we evaluate them to see do they need systemic anticoagulants or not. We evaluate that by using something called the CHADS-VASC score. Um, this used to just be CHADS, but we have um, CHADS-2, but we've come up with a new um, risk score calculation. Um, and CHADS-VASC is an acronym for the different risk factors that we take into account when deciding if the patient needs to be on um, systemic anticoagulation therapy or not. We'll look at how we calculate the Chadzavosk score in a second, um, but each of the letters correlates with a different um, risk factor, like age, for example, um, is a risk factor, higher age, and then um, or S for sex. Um, <clears throat> and then the twos are there because a couple of the risk factors, for example, advanced age, um, counts as two points for risk as opposed to just one point for risk. Um, so I'll show you guys how we calculate that in a second. But we use that risk score um, calculation in order to determine if the person needs to be on systemic anticoagulants or not. Antithrombotic therapy is initiated in all patients undergoing cardioversion to normal sinus rhythm, um, whether or not that cardioversion is electronic or um, pharmacologic. We anticoagulate those patients. And then also all patients whose risk for embolism is greater than their risk for bleeding, right? Because when you do anticoagulants, that's the big concern is a bleed, right? That you thin the blood so much that they bleed. And things like intracranial hemorrhage um, can be possibly fatal. So we look at the patient and we say, okay, which, is, which risk is worse? The risk that they're gonna throw a clot and have a stroke or the risk that they're gonna bleed and something serious like ICH is going to occur. The way that we evaluate that, again, is with the CHADS-VASC score. Um, <clears throat> the, the strong rule that we have is that patients with a score of two or greater get anticoagulation. Now, this is with something like warfarin, um, which was like our classic anticoagulant that we would use, or now we have some newer agents um, <clears throat> we call them NOAX, N-O-A-C, new or novel oral anticoagulants. Um, these are things like Dipigatran, for example. We'll talk about all of those as well as warfarin as we go through this presentation. Um, so if they've got a risk score of two or greater, we definitely put them on anticoagulants. If they've got a risk score of one, we evaluate. Not all risks are created equal. Um, so we evaluate the patient to see whether or not we think they would benefit. If they have a risk score of zero, we do not need to put them on um, systemic anticoagulation because in that patient, the um, additional risk for bleeding that we're, we're you know, 
um, getting by giving them this anticoagulation, that risk for bleed is greater than their risk for a embolism. All right, so <clears throat> our first half of the lecture, we're going to be talking about um, the anticoagulation that we're going to give, um, if we're going to give it, what we're going to give, and then some specifics about those anticoagulants. The second half of the lecture will be where we address this question of rate control versus rhythm control. When you look at a patient with AFib, um, <clears throat> the heart is beating really, really fast, right? I mean, the atria are beating at you know, greater than 300 beats per minute. So they're not even actually contracting. Um, <clears throat> now, not all of those, um, not all of those action potentials get down to the ventricles, but the ventricles are still beating at an increased rate. And as you guys know, when the ventricles are beating so fast, they're not filling appropriately. So you end up with a um, decrease in cardiac output. Initially, um, control of the ventricular rate is necessary really for all patients for symptomatic improvement. So the ventricles need to be slowed to a manageable rate, um, regardless of which long-term strategy you choose. Um, and then <clears throat> once the ventricular rate is stable, you have to decide whether you're going to pursue rhythm control, where the patients are converted to normal sinus rhythm. Um, <clears throat> when patients are converted to normal sinus rhythm, um, antiarrhythmics can be used, so drugs can be used to maintain that normal sinus rhythm. Um, but even if we use catheter ablation, we will use antiarrhythmic drugs prior to um, and after that catheter ablation. Surgery can also be used. Uh, if rate control is pursued, so if we're going to um, not try and convert the patient back to a normal sinus rhythm, but we are going to just try and slow the rate of the ventricles. Um, in that case, what we want to do is slow um, conduction across the AV node. So the atria are still going to be fibrillating. The atria are still going to be beating super, super fast. But if we slow conduction through the AV node down to the ventricles, we decrease the number of action potentials that are able to get down to the ventricles. So we slow the rate of the ventricles. Um, and in doing so, we improve their ability to pump blood effectively. Drugs that we typically use for rate control include beta blockers, so things like atenolol or um, metoprolol. We use non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, which include diltiazem and verapamil. And then we can also use a drug called digoxin. So first we're going to talk about um, antithrombotic therapy in patients with atrial fibrillation. So anticoagulation. Um, when we're deciding on the um, antithrombotic therapy arm of AFib treatment, there are three major questions that we need to ask ourselves. One, should the patient be anticoagulated? Right? Just because they, AFib, they have AFib doesn't mean that they absolutely have to be. So we need to evaluate the need for anticoagulation. Two, which anticoagulant do I use? You don't just throw warfarin at everybody. We have other agents now that are easier to use and probably more um, efficacious. So do I anticoagulate them? What do I anticoagulate them with? And how do I start it? Do I use a loading dose? Do I not? Do I have to bridge therapy? Those are all questions you guys should be familiar with um, and know how to analyze in the patient. So first we'll talk about do I anticoagulate this specific patient? I told you guys that we use the CHADS-VASC um, risk score calculation in order to decide if the patient needs anticoagulation. Um, <clears throat> remember zero, a score of zero means no, a score of one means maybe, a score of two means yes, they need anticoagulation. So CHADS-VASC correlates with all of these different risk factors. So C, congestive heart failure, H, hypertension, age with to subscript. Age is age over 75 years old. You'll notice that there are two A's in this. Age is in here twice um, because there are a couple different age categories. Age over 75 years old is worth two points. That is a very big risk factor. Um, the older the patient, the higher the risk for um, embolus formation. D for diabetes mellitus, 
S for previous stroke, TIA, or thromboembolism. This is essentially, are they more prone to throw clots? Does this patient have a tendency to throw clots for some reason? If so, that's another one that is a big risk factor. That one's also worth two points. Um, <clears throat> and then our VASC is, is there vascular disease present? Um, then this is our second age, age 65 to 74. Um, that's not as big of a risk factor as over 75, but this is a big risk factor. Again, age is a really big deal here. And then um, S is sex. Female patients are at a higher risk here, so if the person is female, that counts as one point. Now, you look at your patient, <clears throat> see what risk factors they have, and add up the number. If they have two or greater, yes, they need anticoagulation. The reason I say maybe if there are one um, is you have to look at the individual patient. Again, not all risks are created equal, even among those with the same score. So say you have a person who is one, they have a score of one, but their one comes from age, right? Say they are age 74 years old, and that's the only risk factor. And then say you have another patient who is 54 years old, and she has a score of one, and the only reason she has a score of one is because she is female. Those two patients do not have the same risk for um, clot. This patient who's 74 has a much greater risk. Um, one, their age is almost to the point to where it counts as a two. Um, and again, age is a bigger risk factor than sex. So looking at those two patients, the female, I would not put her on anticoagulation. In that case, she has a really low risk for clot, but her risk for bleed on the, on the anticoagulants is, is there. So the bleeding risk is greater. I would not put her on anticoagulants. This guy who is 74 years old, I would put him on anticoagulants. Um, so patients with the one, you've got to be able to evaluate yourself and use some clinical judgment. So once we decide, does this person need anticoagulants or not? Um, if we decide that yes, they need anticoagulation, at that point we need to decide, okay, what anticoagulant do I give? Do I give them warfarin or do I give them um, one of the NOACs, one of the new um, novel oral anticoagulant medications? Um, this is the algorithm again that we would use to decide what um, anticoagulant to use or if this patient is just a complex patient and we need to refer them. Um, I'm not gonna go through this in, in huge detail with you guys because I have the, the key points, the big stuff on the next slide, but I do wanna provide this to you um, <clears throat> just so that you guys can go back and look at it. It's not very simple. Uh, it's not you know a simple algorithm where it says, yes, you know, try dabigatran. If that doesn't work, try you know, warfarin. If that doesn't work, try this. Like It's complex. Um, so again, I have this here for you guys to look at it. We'll go through the highlights on the next slide. In general, you see up here is just the decision to start anticoagulation or not. Um, if the risk score is zero, no anticoagulation. Um, if it's one, you see suggest. And again, that depends on the patient themselves. Um, <clears throat> and that's going to be a, a, a clinical decision on your part, an educated decision on your part. Um, two or greater, we recommend anticoagulation. They need to be on anticoagulation. Um, <clears throat> and then it goes down from there. If they've had a recent stroke, this is a complex patient, refer them to someone else. If not, then look, have they been on an anticoagulant or not? Um, if they have been on an anticoagulant and um, they've been on warfarin, at that point, you're going to decide, is the warfarin effective for them or not? If it is, stick with it. If not, adjust. Um, and then over here, you just have the decisions for um, regarding new oral anticoagulants. So highlights. Again, our first question is whether or not we're going to start therapy. Um, we've covered this a lot of times. Our next question is the choice of therapy. Now, the new oral anticoagulants, NOACs, or they're also called direct oral anticoagulants. 
um, <clears throat> because they work directly on the clotting cascade. They are either um, like direct thrombin inhibitors or anti 10A, um, whereas warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist. Warfarin prevents the formation of some of the clotting factors. Um, these other agents work directly on the clotting cascade. So that's why we call them direct oral anticoagulants. Now, when we're choosing therapy, these newer agents are recommended for most patients. Um, <clears throat> there are very specific situations when we would recommend um, warfarin as opposed to one of these NOACs. And we'll talk about those in just one second. So again, um, the, the newer um, novel anticoagulants are recommended for most patients. Um, <clears throat> the new anticoagulants include drugs like dabigatran, um, <clears throat> which again is a direct thrombin inhibitor, um, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban. Um, these inhibit factor 10A. Now, the pros of these agents, they are associated with better outcomes. Um, we weren't really sure in the beginning if they were associated with better outcomes than warfarin, but there are more and more and more studies coming out now. And the studies um, overall are tending to show slightly better outcomes. Now that's um, fewer thrombotic events, so fewer clots, and fewer bleeds, so fewer adverse drug effects associated um, with these NOACs. Also, they are easier to use um, in most situations. They're oral meds, just like warfarin is, and they, um, in most situations, there's no monitoring required. Remember with warfarin, the patients have to have their INR checked regularly, and this is a pain. Um, and it's also kind of complex for practitioners to adjust doses um, based off of the, the INR. It's not really easy to stabilize a patient initially on a dose of warfarin. Um, whereas these agents are typically, they have set recommended dosing and there's no monitoring required. So they are easier to use. There's also no dietary restrictions. With warfarin, remember patients have to have a stable intake of vitamin K because that's how the drug works. It blocks vitamin K. So if they're stabilized on a dose and then all of a sudden they you know, decide they're gonna eat spinach salads every meal, um, then they're adjusting their, the amount of vitamin K that they're taking in and that's gonna adjust the um, warfarin efficacy in their INR. So these agents have no dietary restrictions um, and no monitoring. So they are easier to use. Cons, high cost. Um, cost is a big deal here. These are much more expensive. So if your patient simply can't afford it, it will not work. Um, if they don't take it, it's not gonna work. So um, this is a situation where it is important to be cognizant of the fact that they're expensive and not all patients can afford them. In that case, it's better to give them warfarin, which is cheap, um, and deal with the, you know, the annoyance of testing and whatnot, because at least then they're taking the medication. Um, <clears throat> a lack of experience. We don't have long-term experience with these drugs, so it is possible that in the future something is going to pop up that we didn't know about. Um, and then lack of experience with prescribing. Um, practitioners are not as comfortable prescribing these meds, so I do recommend that you get comfortable with at least a couple of these. Um, you know, get comfortable with dabigatran and then one of the 10A inhibitors and make sure you understand how to start it, um, issues, contraindications. That way you don't prescribe warfarin just because you don't know about these. Um, another issue is lack of compliance monitoring. So monitoring the INR with warfarin, we think of it as a bad thing, right? It's annoying to have to check the INR, but it's also a good way to know if the drug is working. Um, if the INR is not in the therapeutic range, well, you adjust the dose. Um, and you get to the therapeutic range. We don't have that, um, the ability to easily check compliance or check efficacy with these agents. So this kind of um, goes along with the high cost as well. If you prescribe it and it's super, super expensive and the patient's you know, ashamed to tell you that they can't afford it, so what the patient does instead is takes one every three days instead of one every day to try and stretch it out, 
you're not going to know that. Um, with Warfarin, you would know. You would get the INR and you would know we're not at a good level and then you would know to address it with the patient. Um, we don't have that ability with these agents, so it's important to have good rapport with your patient and to really talk about it um, and be cognizant of the, the problem with cost and to make sure that your patient knows how important the medication is and that the only way we're going to know it's not working is you know, when they throw a clot, which is a really big deal. So um, okay, good rapport with your patient. Um, these agents are not recommended in pregnant patients. Um, in pregnant patients, low molecular weight heparins are recommended. Um, so heparin itself and then anoxaparin, um, which is a low molecular weight heparin, are both able to be given to pregnant patients. All right, so I said that these newer agents are recommended in most patients. But there are some specific situations where warfarin would be recommended instead. Um, and one situation is just if the patient's already stabilized on warfarin and doing well. Um, if they've been taking warfarin for some time and they are compliant with INR testing, um, they haven't had any bleeds or problems like that, and if they are in an effective range so um, the INR is in the target range greater than 65% of the time. So if you are getting INRs and they're, you know, too low and then okay and then too low and then okay and then too high, that patient's not stabilized and it's better to, to adjust to change to one of the other agents. But if the patient's really stable, they're really compliant with everything, they're in the target INR range um, for the majority of the time, then that's okay to just keep them on warfarin. There's no need to change in that case. Unless the patient tells you, I am done, I'm sick of this, I don't wanna do this testing anymore. In that case, you know, I would have a discussion of pros and cons and, and you know, they could change. Otherwise, it's okay to leave them on warfarin. You don't have to change them. Um, also, if the patient has a mechanical heart valve or severe mitral stenosis, um, you should give them the warfarin. And the reason for this is there's a lot of evidence of warfarin's effectiveness in these um, or efficacy in these situations. So warfarin is, is recommended for these as well as for the AFib. Um, they should not get the NOAG. Also, if cost is a barrier, again, if the patient can't afford the medication, they can't take the medication, which means it can't work. Um, so if cost is a barrier, warfarin is a lot, um, a lot less expensive. It's very inexpensive, actually. If the patient has severe um, chronic kidney disease, um, <clears throat> the other agents have dosing adjustments for chronic kidney disease and only one of them is approved in severe chronic kidney disease that's the apixaban i believe um, is the only one that even can be used in severe chronic kidney disease warfarin is also recommended in patients with severe hepatic impairment and then if the um, newer agent is contraindicated for any other reason there are a lot of drug interactions that are possible um, with the newer agents and if patients are concurrently on um, enzyme inducers, so like phenytoin, for example, um, phenytoin for epilepsy, or um, HIV patients who are on protease inhibitors, these drugs can induce the metabolism of the NOAX, and then the NOAX isn't going to be working. Um, there are drug interactions that are possible with warfarin, but remember with warfarin, we have the benefit of the INR which again, it's normally a pain and we don't like the monitoring, but it does give us the ability to check to make sure that the patient is being anticoagulated. So if there are drug interactions that exist that are making you question how much of the drug is actually available, um, with the warfarin, we can just order frequent INRs and we can, we can check, right? We can see, okay, you know, I know that since I increased the dose, um, you know, now, even with the enzyme inducer, I'm still in a therapeutic INR. Um, it's really difficult to check whether you're in therapeutic ranges or not with these other agents. Okay, so in patients with um, atrial fibrillation, 
and with their anticoagulation we have answered the first couple questions right do we need to anticoagulate this patient and which anticoagulant should we use um, <clears throat> in most cases the noax in specific situations we said we can give warfarin now the last question we need to answer is how do i initiate therapy um, with all of these different agents um, bridging with heparin is not recommended in most patients um, what bridging is, is it's like it's providing a really rapid anticoagulation while we wait for the oral anticoagulant to start working. Um, <clears throat> so these newer agents, the NOAX, they start working really quickly um, because they work directly on the clotting cascade and they block the clotting cascade from, from happening. But warfarin actually takes a while before it's working. Because remember, what warfarin does is it prevents the production of some of the clotting factors. Now, there are already clotting factors that have been made that are in the bloodstream. So if I start taking the warfarin right now and it stops the production of new clotting factors, I can still clot as long as those old ones are in circulation. So you have to wait for the old clotting factors to be cleared from circulation before the warfarin starts working. So there is a short period of time with warfarin um, before you see the full effect. You typically don't see the full effect of warfarin until about seven days after therapy is started. Um, <clears throat> so what bridging is, is with um, bridging is we give heparin like IV um, or injected heparin and that provides anticoagulation immediately and that covers you until the warfarin is fully working. Uh, we used to do this a lot more. Um, bridging is now not recommended in most patients. The other situation, um, the only situation where we would bridge a person is if they're starting warfarin and they've had a prior thrombotic event. So in that case, they're really at a higher risk so we can bridge them. Um, Otherwise, if they're starting warfarin and they haven't had a prior thrombotic event, bridging is not necessary. Um, and then with the NOACs, with the newer agents, it's not necessary at all, regardless of any prior events. Um, because again, these become effective or they start working a lot more quickly because they're blocking the actual cascade itself um, by inhibiting either factor 10A or by inhibiting thrombin directly. So, um, <clears throat> then when we are starting therapy, we'll talk about how we start warfarin and then how we start the specific NOAX. Warfarin is dosed to a goal INR of about two to three. So the, the final dose that your patient ends with is going to be very different depending on the patient. Um, however, initially, we typically will start with a daily dose of five milligrams or less. Um, we used to use a higher loading dose of like up to 10 milligrams, but higher loading doses are associated with poor outcomes. Um, they were associated with more bleeding, but they were not associated with um, uh, faster attainment of a goal INR. So uh, higher loading doses are, are not recommended. We start with an initial daily dose of five milligrams in most patients, and then we test the INR on day three. Again, we're not going to see the, um, the full effect of warfarin until about day seven, but this INR on day three will at least allow us to see if, if the INR is spiking super, super high, and then we can stop that dose um, before we have a major bleeding event. But keep in mind that you know, if the INR is slowly climbing, and on day three the INR is you know, getting close to range but not there, keep in mind that it is still going to continue to climb, that you're not at full therapy yet. Um, <clears throat> a lower initial dose of 2.5 milligrams is recommended in um, specific patients who are at higher risk. So this would be in elderly patients, um, relatively frail patients, um, patients with chronic kidney disease, um, or patients who are on warfarin enhancing drugs, for example, like amiodarone, which amiodarone is a, an antiarrhythmic, so it is possible that the patient would be on amiodarone 
um, in that situation, patients will be started on a the lower 2.5 milligram a day dose. Now, um, we talk about the testing the INR on day three. That's in the outpatient setting. If you have a patient who's in the hospital, you're going to get their INR daily. Now, it is important when you're adjusting the dose based off of the INR to remember that dose adjustments take up to about three days to show in the INR. So say I had a patient on um, you know, five milligrams a day and the INR was sub-therapeutic, it was too low, and I increased my dose to 7.5 milligrams a day, and then I take the INR the next day and it's still not up. Do you think you wanna increase the dose again? No because that dose increase to 7.5 is not showing in the INR yet, right? Remember, it takes time. So you need to give that 7.5 milligrams for about three doses and then look at the INR. And that will show you if it's uh, if you're up into the, the effective range or if you need to increase the dose again. This is a really big mistake that practitioners make um is adjusting the dose too quickly and making these knee-jerk reactions instead of um, waiting the appropriate amount of time big deal um so this is how we would initiate therapy with warfarin initiating therapy with the um the new oral anticoagulants is a little bit more um, <clears throat> stabilized. It's there's just normal recommendations for all patients. You don't have to dose to a specific um, a specific you know INR or or specific goal range. Dabigatran um, is typically started at 150 milligrams BID, so two times daily. Um, we used to. Uh, recommend 110 milligrams BID, but now 110 milligrams BID is only in specific patients. Um, 110 milligrams is in patients at risk for bleeding. In most patients, the 150 milligrams BID is going to be recommended. Um, <clears throat> however, if you have a patient who is um, more likely to bleed, say the platelets are on the relatively low end, for example, um, or they've had a prior bleed in the past, um, <clears throat> for those patients, 110 milligrams twice a day is acceptable. Edoxaban, um, <clears throat> this is interesting. For edoxaban, if the GFR, um, the estimated GFR, so if the estimated glomerular filtration rate is between 50 and 95, then we recommend 60 milligrams a day. Sorry, let me get room. If the um, GFR, estimated GFR is between 30 and 50, right? So if their, their kidney function is less than that, um, then the drug can accumulate and we give a lower dose. We give 30 milligrams daily. If the GFR is greater than 95, right? So if they've got great kidney function, um, we do not give it. So edoxaban is not given to patients with estimated GFR greater than 95 due to an increased risk of stroke. Um, in those patients, studies have shown they just clear the drug really rapidly and are not able to keep it at a concentration that is high enough to be effective. Um, so it's not given to those patients. Um, <clears throat> Apaxaban is typically dosed at five milligrams BID. Um, we do give a lower dose in specific at-risk patients. So we would start with 2.5 milligrams BID, if the person is greater than 80 years old, if their weight is less than 60 kilograms, or if serum creatinine is greater than 1.5. In other words, if they have decreased kidney function. Um, <clears throat> finally, rivaroxaban is typically dosed at um, 20 milligrams daily. But again, it's cleared by the kidneys. So if estimated GFR is less than 50, then we would give 15 
milligrams daily instead. Okay, so easier, right? These are like typical recommended doses to give daily, as opposed to the warfarin where we just say, hey, start at about this and then adjust it. Not really sure where you're going to end up. Um, that's quite a bit more complex. All right, so this is a sample, um, a sample kind of chart that tells you how to adjust warfarin dosing. And different um, different facilities, different hospitals have their own um, regimens that they follow, but this is pretty typical. Um, here you see the INR, and then over here you see how you would adjust the weekly dose. Now this is not like when you're first initiating it, this is a normal stable patient. Um, and just to kind of keep in mind, typically you would monitor um, INR every four weeks. Um, if the person's out of range though, so if they're not between two and three, then you're gonna monitor the INR weekly. So you keep track of it really closely um, or at least weekly um, if they're out of range. So um, <clears throat> this over here, this increase or decrease by a certain percentage, this is the, um, like the weekly dose. So this example down here is, is really great. So this says a person taking 30 milligrams per week, that's the, you add up the milligrams every day and they're taking a total of 30 milligrams a week um, of warfarin has an INR of 1.8. So if you look over here, 1.8 says that we should increase by 10% a week. So they were taking 30 milligrams a week, 10% of that is three milligrams. So now they need to take 33 milligrams per week. And you just divide that up as evenly as possible. Um, so the new regimen that they said is do five milligrams a day, six days a week, and then three milligrams on the remaining day. Right, so that's a total of 33 milligrams a week. Um, <clears throat> There's you know numerous ways you could do it. Another way would be five milligrams five days a week, four milligrams two days a week. Um, so you can spread it out however you want as long as it's spread out relatively evenly. Um, and then you see if the INR was two to three, no change. Um, <clears throat> 3.01 to four decreased by 10%. Um, if the INR gets higher, you hold a dose and then start with a lower dose. Um, hold if it's really high hold until the INR is between two and three and then start with an even lower dose okay so this is a pretty decent chart um, I'm not going to go through this uh, details with you guys it's good for you guys to um, to read but this is a chart that explains how you switch from one to the next if you're changing from um, from one of the newer agents to warfarin so say they were on one of the newer agents, they lost their insurance and they cannot take it any longer and they need to go to warfarin. This tells you how you can switch with each of the um, each of the agents. You'll notice that there is overlap with all of them. So remember that once when you're taking warfarin, it's not working right away because you've got to wait for those factors to be cleared from the body, the factors that are already made to be cleared. So you're overlapping this drug with warfarin um, either some of them are like three days, some of them are until the INR is therapeutic on warfarin, um, but you do overlap. This slide is the opposite. This is when we're switching from warfarin to one of the newer agents. So say a patient is, um, you know, not keeping up with their testing of the INR, or they're just sick of it, or they got new insurance that's great and they want to try one of these other agents. Um, at that, in that situation, you're going to be changing from warfarin to um, one of the new agents. You'll notice that you do not have to overlap these. You don't, um, you actually don't uh, overlap these. In all cases, you stop the warfarin, right? Monitor the INR and start the new agent when the INR is less than, you know, two, less than two, less than 2.5, um, and less than three. So you do not overlap um, when you're going from warfarin to one of these newer agents. Um, switching from one of the newer agents to another, um, you don't overlap, you just change like the next dose you take with the new one. So start the second um, new agent when the next dose is due. 
no overlap, not confusing, really simple. Um, and, and just kind of to mention really quick, between these newer agents, there's not enough information out to recommend one versus the other. Um, we don't have like double blind placebo, con or not placebo controlled, but we don't have, um, you know, double blind head to head trials yet to say that one agent is greater than the other. Um, but you do see it's really easy to change from one to the other. Okay, so for the remainder of the lecture, um, we're going to change gears and we'll talk about the second component to treating atrial fibrillation. And this is whether we're going to choose a rate control strategy or a rhythm control strategy. Um, <clears throat> in general, rate control is preferred for asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic AFib patients who are 65 years or older. Um, the rate control strategy prevents tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy um, and it avoids a lot of the hemodynamic instability. A lot of studies show that there may be some mortality benefit to patients who are on rate control strategy. And then we do see that some patients can spontaneously convert to normal sinus rhythm um, anyhow. When we talk about using a rate control strategy and slowing down the rate of those ventricles, again, we use beta blockers like tenolol, um, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like deltaism verapamil, or for some patients, we can use digoxin. The goal is a heart rate less than 80 beats per minute um, and less than 110 beats per minute during moderate exercise, like what you would see with the six minute walk test. Rhythm control is recommended um, for most patients with AFib who are younger than 65 years of age, um, particularly, th particularly those who remain symptomatic. Um, <clears throat> and for the younger patients who require optimal hemodynamics or optimal ejection fraction from the ventricles. Um, Rhythm control is, is also used if we're unable to control the rate. So if we pursue a rate control strategy and we, we can't, we cannot manage it, at that point we can try and convert to normal sinus rhythm. Um, also patients who remain symptomatic. So if we're able to attain rate, con rate control and then the patient remains symptomatic, at that point we can try to convert to normal sinus rhythm. And then again, we said younger patients who require optimal hemodynamics. Um, so patients, for example, who um, are young enough to still, you know, be athletes, be athletic, who want to remain very physically active. Um, in this case, switching to rhythm control could be beneficial. In the notes section of the PowerPoint, I've included a link to a good up-to-date article that um, compares the two strategies. Beta blockers are commonly used for rate control. On the next slide, we'll talk about how we use them chronically when we're pursuing a rate control strategy. Um, but we can also use beta blockers intravenously in the acute setting. Um, if we need to um, control the rate in a, an unstable patient while we try and make plans for cardioversion. Um, you don't just let the, the patient sit there um, unstably. You do try and control the rate in the meantime until you can cardiovert. And we can do that with IV beta blockers. Um, metoprolol, propranolol, and esmolol are all available IV. Um, here you see the dosing regimens. For metoprolol, we give an IV bolus of 2.5 milligrams um, given over two minutes, and then you can repeat that at five, um, milligram, or, so five minute intervals up to a total of 15 milligrams. Propranolol, um, again, a milligram infused over a minute, and you can also repeat that up to three doses, um, and you give it at two milligram or two minute intervals. Um, esmolol is interesting. Um, esmolol is metabolized by red blood cell esterases. Um, so it has a very, very short duration of action. Um, the duration of action is just like 10 to 20 minutes. Um, so this is useful in situations where you're not sure if the person is going to be able to tolerate the beta blocker. Um, you can give them so like if blood pressure is kind of low or on the low end and you're not sure if they're going to tolerate it, 
um, hemodynamically, you can give the the esmolol, and then you know that it's going to be cleared out of the bloodstream relatively quickly. If it's tolerated, then you can switch to one of the longer acting agents. Um, esmolol is given at 50 micrograms per kilogram per minute, and it can be increased um, at 30 minute intervals. If you're pursuing a long-term rate control, rate control strategy, beta blockers are typically prescribed. Um, there are numerous oral beta blockers that are effective in this case. Um, atenolol, natalol, extended release metoprolol, and propranolol are all um, um, long-acting, so they allow for um, daily dosing. Atenolol um, tends to have kind of all different benefits, all of the good points from different types of beta blockers. So atenolol is long acting. Um, it can be prescribed once daily. Um, atenolol is selective for beta one receptors. So you don't have, um, <clears throat> you don't have the, the contraindication with lung issues with um, beta two blockade. Um, atenolol also happens to have um, the least CNS or fewer CNS side effects. So atenolol is a really good choice to go with for rate control in AFib. It started at 25 milligrams daily and slowly titrated up to a goal dose of 100 milligrams daily. Um, you can go above that though. 100 milligrams is the typical goal, but it's not the max dose. You can increase all the way up to 200 milligrams daily if needed to control the rate, to get the rate down under 80 beats per minute, 110 during exercise. Um, a couple notes to keep in mind um, to, to help you remember from your original farm classes. With beta blockers, you start low and go slow. Um, hence, you notice we start at 25 milligrams. We don't just slap on 100 milligrams right away. Um, it is important to start low and go slow, and that helps to minimize side effects, and it allows the system to get used to the effects of the beta blocker. Um, also, beta blockers cannot be stopped abruptly. Um, there are big rebound events that occur if so, and the patient needs to know this. Um, patients do things without us knowing all the time, whether we want them to or not. Uh, and if you don't warn the patient, then they have no way of knowing that they can't just stop it. There are some side effects of beta blockers that are very problematic. We'll talk about them in a second. They interfere with daily living. So um, it's, it's not uncommon for a patient to want to just stop it when they get sick of those side effects. So they need to know that they cannot stop it abruptly. If they want to change to another drug, that is okay, but you have to guide them through that process so that it's done safely. Side effects include obviously hypotension and bradycardia just because of the normal action of the drug. Um, also, fatigue and reduced exercise tolerance initially. And it's important to tell patients this normally does go away. It's worse in the beginning. And then as your body um, <clears throat> gets used to the effects of the beta blocker, there's actually increased um, exercise tolerance and um, increased effectiveness of the, the cardiovascular system. Um, but they need to be warned of this. Otherwise, they just feel terrible. And they think, why am I taking this drug that makes me feel worse? Um, also, sexual side effects, unfortunately, are common with beta blockers. Um, Non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, um, which are verapamil and diltiazem, can also be used for rate control. Um, if it's acute rate control, we give the um, IV formulation. If it's chronic rate control, then we give oral verapamil and diltiazem. Um, <clears throat> verapamil is started at 40 milligrams TID or QID, um, so three or four times daily, and we increase that to a max dose of 360 milligrams daily. Um, there are extended release formulations of verapamil, but for some reason they are typically not efficacious in AFib. So we do not recommend the extended release formulations. So just looking at that, um, like if you're comparing atenolol to verabamil, um, atenolol is taken once daily. It's a lot easier to take that and, um, you know, to make sure that the patient's compliant. It's hard to get someone to take something four times a day and not be forgetting it. <clears throat> 
Um, the dose of verapamil is typically limited by severe constipation and edema. This is important to keep in mind. Um, sometimes you can't actually get to that effective dose because of the constipation. Um, that's kind of like a standout thing. If you think verapamil, you should be thinking constipation. Uh, diltiazem is given at 30 milligrams QID, increased up to a max dose of 360 to 480 daily. Um, diltiazem can be given as the extended release formulation. Um, you just give the same daily dose in either one or two divided doses. So that is a little bit easier to use as far as compliance goes. A few notes to keep in mind when we talk about the calcium channel blockers. Um, these have negative inotropic effects. Um, decreasing the amount of calcium that comes into the, the cardiac myocyte decreases the strength that it contracts with. Um, so the ventricles are not pumping as hard. They're not contracting as hard. So uh, this is problematic in heart failure and they are contraindicated in class three or four heart failure. Um, also use caution when combining them with other negative inotropes. So beta blockers, for example, have negative both chronotropic and inotropic effects. So you wouldn't want to combine these with a beta blocker. Um, verapamil interacts with digoxin. It increases digoxin concentrations, in, um, which is problematic because digoxin is a neurotherapeutic index drug. And then caution in significant liver disease or patients who are already hypotensive. Finally, um, our last slide, we'll finish today with a quick discussion of digoxin. Um, <clears throat> digoxin is a sodium potassium ATPase inhibitor that slows conduction through the AV node. Um, <clears throat> now, digoxin is not as effective as the other agents, and it's associated with um, a higher mortality rate uh, at higher concentrations. So we typically do not recommend digoxin as first-line therapy, and we don't recommend it at all in elderly patients. So digoxin is reserved for patients whose rate is not controlled on a beta blocker and or calcium channel blocker or AV nodal ablation. So we kind of try everything we can try, and then if that doesn't work, we can try the digoxin. Digoxin is available in both oral and IV formulations. Um, the typical chronic dose of oral digoxin is going to be um, 0 0.125 milligrams to um, 0 0.25 milligrams daily. So very, very small doses. Um, and this is a narrow therapeutic index drug. Remember that that means there's not very much difference between the effective dose and the toxic dose. Um, so you have to monitor it very closely to ensure that you're not getting into the toxic ranges and the fatal ranges to make sure that you're down in the um, effective area, but you're not in the dangerous area. So periodic um, serum concentration monitoring is necessary with digoxin. Um, and there are a lot of drug interactions with digoxin as well. So that's like a double ugh because um, it's neurotherapeutic index, so there's not room for mess ups. And then there's a bunch of stuff that interacts with it, um, which makes mess ups more likely. So digoxin's kind of a rough drug to use. Um, the target serum concentration is 0 0.9 nanograms per milliliter. That's where you wanna get. Um, it's kind of easy to adjust the dose based on the serum concentration because there's a linear relationship between the dose and the serum concentration. So say patients at steady state, right? They've been taking it, they're at steady state concentration and their serum concentration comes back at 1.6 nanograms per milliliter. And say that, um, that they're taking the 0.25 milligram dose. So if their concentration is 1.6 and we want it to go down to about 0.9, so say um, half of 1.6 is 0.8, that would be good. So if we wanna decrease this down to 0.8, that's half, right? We've decreased the concentration by half. That means we have to decrease the dose by half. So we would wanna decrease the dose from 0.25 to 0.1. Oop, 
0.125. Right? That's pretty easy <laughs> adjustments. Not all drugs are that easy to adjust. So decreasing the dose by half should de decrease the serum concentration by half because of that linear relationship. Um, when we look at digoxin, digoxin has a really long um, half-life. And because of that, you need to keep that in mind when you're thinking about, um, you know, dosing or thinking about um, drug interactions. So, for example, if you've got a patient on digoxin and you are about to start them on another medication that um, interacts with it, um, then you don't just stop the digoxin and start the other med the next day and assume there's not going to be any problems. The digoxin is going to stay in the system for a while. Um, I did want to tell you guys this target of 0 0.9. The target for AFib used to be 1 to 2. Um, the target for heart failure was much lower. The heart failure target was 0 0.5 to 0 0.8. Um, however, with concentrations greater than 1, um, we've seen a lot of bad adverse drug effects. Um, and concentrations greater than 1 are associated with increased mortality. So the new rate that um, is being recommended is 0 0.9. Um, now, if rate control is not achieved at 0 0.9, the dose can be increased. Um, but we shoot for 0 0.9 to start to see if that's effective in the patient um, to hope to avoid that increased mortality. Uh, the dose for digoxin is dose based off of lean body weight. Um, the drug does tend to, um, to penetrate into muscle. And then dose adjustments are made in renal failure and in patients with low body weight, less than 45 kilograms. Um, I've taken up every last second of time that I had. Um, so <clears throat> if you have any questions, guys, please feel free to shoot me an email and I'll get back to you guys um, as soon as possible on those. And I thank you for your attention. I hope you guys have a great day.